Good morning, uh, I'm Charlotte, I work for AOC Archaeology Group and I'm speaking to you today about Witadour Historic Heart of the Lammer Muirs, a community arts and archaeology project. Um, the project was conceived by Chris Bowles, who as many of you will know was previously archaeologist for Scottish Borders Council, but has since moved on to pastor as new. Um, so it's kind of key to mention here the initial project design was Chris's, it was his baby, he sought funding and generally got the project off the ground, so all credit to him um, for all of that. I know he's been keeping up with project developments on social media. Uh, maybe he's watching. I think it's probably very early in the morning where he is, but hello if he's watching. Um, in the meantime, we've been working closely with Keith Elliott, who has taken on management of the project from the council's end. So as the name suggests, our uh, project area is uh, closely tied to the Whittador water, specifically its catchment area, which you can see on this slide here. Uh, the Whittador runs from Whittingham Parish in East Lothian, down through the borders and uh, finally joining the Tweed um, at uh, Berwick. So our project spans both uh, Scottish borders and East Lothian as well and we're very grateful to various people at East Lothian Council for their support, um, in particular Stephanie Leith. Um, now the project was not only a community archaeology project but also an arts project so you'll be hearing from Rob McTaggart from CNC Associates um, that's the heritage consultancy that managed the art side of things and we'll be sharing his video um, after my presentation. Uh, so moving on now to the archaeology, the jumping off point for the archaeology element of the project was LIDAR data, which was collected as part of the project. Um, in case anyone isn't familiar with LIDAR, it stands for light detection, and light detection and ranging, and is essentially a form of airborne laser scanning. So millions of points are collected from a laser scanner mounted onto a light aircraft, and the data gathered is processed to create 3D models. Um, but the really exciting thing about LIDAR from an archaeologist's point of view is that we can uh, filter out things that might be obscuring archaeology. Uh, so things like vegetation, trees, bracken, heather, anything that might cover up the lumps and bumps that uh, uh, might be archaeological in nature. So in that way, LIDAR allows us to discover new archaeological sites that weren't previously known about and also allows us to re-examine known sites and let it get a clearer picture of them. Um, so the LIDAR survey for this project covered 62 square kilometres and a processed version of the data is available for anyone to explore via the project website. Now at the very beginning of the project we ran a workshop to help people get to grips with exploring the LiDAR data and um, there's also information now on the uh, on the website on how to use the web map and explore it for yourself. And um, so since the project's launch in June last year users have identified and contributed over 200 new archaeological sites to the project database and these range from unrecorded sheepfolds and field boundaries to possible prehistoric settlements, burial cairns and historic farmsteads. Um, so you can take a look at some of the highlights of those kind of new discoveries over on the website and also have a little look for yourself. So I'll move on now to the field work that we undertook as part of the project, all of which was undertaken by volunteers under the guidance of our archaeologists. So I'll say a massive thank you to everyone who contributed their time and energy to the project, and uh, not least because a lot of the field work took place during the autumn and winter months. And um, so many thanks to all of our very hardy volunteers. So I'll give you a quick whistle stop tour through really just some of the highlights of the project. There's definitely not time to talk about everything, but I'll just run through um, three of the projects that we, uh, three of the excavations that we um, undertook as part of this. <clears throat> so first up then, a site right on the edge of the Whittador Reservoir. It sits within forestry on a low rise extending out into the reservoir, uh, which was only flooded in the 1960s. So before that, the site would have been um, overlooking just the Whittador water and its valley. And you can see here uh, the location of it on the second edition OS map, created of course before the reservoir was flooded. Uh, so an anomaly was spotted in the LIDAR data, which we thought might represent the re remains of an unrecorded prehistoric burial cairn. You can see it in the top image here, you can just see this kind of highest point here, and then where it shows up on the image with the blue water all around, you can see it in the centre there. And then here's how it appears on the ground, really hard to photograph in amongst all the trees and everything. Um, but we did a quick site visit in the first instance and decided that we did think there was uh, something there, that it was real and headed back later on to investigate. Um, so we excavated two fairly small trenches, one trench in the centre of the mound and a second sort of long thin one running down over the side to try and catch the edge. And um, it became apparent very quickly that we did appear to be coming down onto cairn material uh, and a rim shard from an early Bronze Age beaker was a welcome discovery in the central trench. Um, in the long trench running down over the side of the feature, we uncovered possibly a um, kerb along the edge of the cairn material, although slipped forward from its original position, and perhaps an old ground surface underlying the cairn material. We've got two radiocarbon dates for this site, one from beneath the cairn material in the central trench, 
um, which returned a date within the early 11th century AD, but a second date from um, one of the contexts underlying the Cairn material in this, uh, the long thin trench down the side, returned a date from the early 10th to late 9th century BC, so within the late Bronze Age. Um, artifacts included this little flint tip, flint blade tip you can see here, probably Mesolithic, and again that um, nice uh, rim shard from an early Bronze Age beaker. So all contributing to a picture of an area with activity over a long period of time. And um, that later radiocarbon date is most likely the result of bioturbation, given the stony nature of the site and also forestry activities in the area, all contributing to disturbance and intermixing of the deposits overlying and within the cairn. Um, given the late Bronze Age radiocarbon date and also that beaker shared, it does seem likely that the cairn is Bronze Age in date. So a nice, exciting new discovery through the project. Um, moving on now, um, the remains of a long, low building in the Bothwell Water Valley. You can see it here in a sort of low aerial view taken during the excavations. Um, the feature had been identified before. It was noted on an aerial fo photo from the 1980s, um, but it wasn't clear what these remains represented. And you can see in the corner there how neatly it appears on the LIDAR data kind of running, um, uh, running on alignment with some rig and furrow there as well. So we decided to um, investigate. <clears throat> Um, we opened up a couple of trenches to reveal um, substantial walls built of turf and stone and um, no interior features or floor surfaces identified um, but a possible sort of annex or lean-to along the western side of the building. Um, a radiocarbon date obtained from a collapse or decay deposit within the interior of the building directly on top of the original ground surface deposit which ran underneath both of the walls returned to date in the second half of the 13th century. Now at 47 metres long and 7 metres wide, it's unlikely that this represents a domestic building. Um, it's more likely an agricultural structure, perhaps a linear sheep house. And there are others marked in the vicinity on early OS maps around here, but there's nothing specifically in the location of this site. So you can see a couple of examples here and um, different construction techniques, presumably to um, how ours appears to have been constructed. But they sort of give you an idea of what we're dealing with, a long, narrow roofed uh, structure, um, which sheep were kept in over the winter months. They aren't especially unusual. There are around 40 of them in various forms listed on Canmore, for example, and plenty more known in England and Wales. But we believe this is the first one to have been excavated in Scotland, but I'm uh, willing to hear otherwise. Please let me know if anyone else has dug one. Um, now, the medieval date is particularly interesting because the site lies within land that was gifted by Earl Cospatrick to the monks of Kelso in the 12th century. So it's possible that this sheep, ho sheep house was associated with Kelso Abbey. Uh, the rent rules for Kelso Abbey in 1290 to 1300 show that they held between seven and 8,000 sheep in one valley alone, indicating just how significant their flocks and the resulting income were. So a nice little glimpse of medieval sheep farming. Um, and we'll stick within the medieval period for our last site, Morham Castle. Some of you might remember my colleague Jessica Lowther spoke about this at Elbeck last year. Uh, this one was a sort of rediscovery of sorts. It's long been known that there was a castle at Morham. Uh, but no trace remained on the ground. You can see here the site of it is marked on the uh, first edition OS map and uh, just to the sort of north of it, um, a field there called Castle Shot, so kind of retaining it in the place name memory at least. Um, the fact that nothing survives on the ground today suggests that it was probably uh, dismantled entirely and the stone um, reused elsewhere. Uh, so a geophysical survey was carried out at the site by Edinburgh Archaeological Field Society on behalf of East Lothian Council at the proposal of the local community in 2012-2013 uh, and this revealed several uh, potential features for investigation which formed the targets for excavations uh, but in the interest of brevity I'll stick to the highlights here. Uh, one of our trenches um, revealed this uh, sort of large curving wall foundation here um, over two meters thick consisting of large stones with a tightly packed fill of rubble and gravel. A pale sandy lime mortar was evident on one side of the foundation um, a radiocarbon date sought for charcoal contained within the mortar returned the earliest date range for the construction of the wall as most likely sometime within the 13th century. Um, finds included Scottish white gritty ware ceramics, possibly from the nearby kiln at Coulston, likely dating to the 13th, 14th centuries. Also a shared of probable medieval glazed floor tile and shares from imported French Loire type jugs, which tend to date to the 16th or more, more often the early 17th century are both suggestive of a site of some status. So we were pleased to be able to rediscover a little bit of East Lothian's past there and put the castle back on the map as such. So I'll wrap up there. I know that's been a bit of a whistle stop tour, but I'll um, hand back over to Callum, who will share a video from um, Rob McTaggart from CMC, who will tell you a little bit about the art side of the project. Hi, my name is Robin McTaggart and I'm a designer with CMC Associates, a heritage and cultural media 
consultancy group based in Scotland. We worked um, with along with the AOC on the Whittier project to develop the in various interpretive aspects of the project. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that and highlight some of the key creative arts projects that were developed during the past year. So you can find out more information about all these projects on the website and I've got the URLs there on screen just now and if you'd like to contact me to ask me further questions on this presentation my email is at the bottom of the screen there. So I'll just explain to you a few of the projects we've decided to highlight today which showcase some of the creative arts schemes that were developed for the project. Professor Brian Edwards um, wanted to document the area through a series of ink, pen and ink sketches documenting buildings of important architectural significance in the area. These focus mainly on the 6th to 19th century period um, with an emphasis on bridges, castles and churches. Um, so he produced a really nice sketchbook of drawings and we decided these were so good that we we would have them printed with a in a hardback copy so there was a run of 50 copies were published in August last year. Um, you can download a draft version of the PDF from the website. As I said it focused mainly on churches so you've got Preston and Churnside and Cranshaws here on this page. And castles, we've got Wedderburn, Hutton and Duns Castle. These are just a few picked out from the sketchbook. Bridges, the Bridget Preston, Elmford and Chermside next to the paper mill. Farm buildings and cottages, sketched lots throughout the area. There's some at Abbey St Bathens there and the estate cottages at Preston. He did a nice selection of ducats around the area. This is um, one just south of Chermside, just near Whitehall Farm. Um, this is one just near Nisbet House, south of Duns. And this is one in the centre of Chermside, which I didn't even know about, um, just behind the school. You can see it plotted on the map there. project is Spirit of Place by Fiona McLachlan Powell. Fiona wanted to um, study different geographical features um, of the area and highlight those and, and draw over the top of them in a line style sketch with blue and black ink to try and emphasise and draw specific features of the landscape and develop these into artistic drawings. So this is a blue ink sketch that shows field and river track systems. She also produced a number of sketches around about Cumbledge Mill and Chapel near Preston and Abbey St Bathens and then some of the drawings were developed into screen prints. Fiona also produced another project about the bondagers who were female labourers employed in the area of East Lothian and the borders. Uh, they worked the land and it was very hard and difficult work and she chose to interpret some of the headdresses that these ladies wore to protect themselves from the harsh wind and weather environments that they worked in. So these are sculptural installations for the bondagers hats along with a pile of blankets from Laidlaw's Mill. This next project is Ghosts in the Reservoir by Etty Spencer. This is a proposal that was put forward to create um, white sort of silhouette sculptural buildings that float on the surface of the Whittier Reservoir. These were to reflect the, the buildings that are now submerged below the reservoir when it was flooded, um, including the, some farm buildings and there was also a Kingside School which is now under the water. This was a proposal that was put forward for the project and assessed but unfortunately it wasn't realised within the timescale of the budget of the project but 
the council have expressed an interest to look at this in the future so we're hoping that one day this will be able to be installed perhaps as a, a temporary sculpture installation. This next project is foraging routes by a landscape architect duo called Sutherlandi. They wanted to create a foraging route, a seasonal foraging route along part of the river bank of the Whittadur water. Um, so they chose an area just south of Preston by the Preston Bridge. That's the starting point and you can see from the map there that the route follows along beside the edge of the river there. Um, so they created a really nice set of illustrations of plants that can be found in the spring and additional notes to go with that uh, describing the plants and also um, what these could be used for whether it was medicinal or in cooking and so they've included some recipes along with that as well. Um, so we've created a really nice leaflet um, produced from their drawings and research and you can download the full foraging routes spring guide from the Whittador project website. The Southern Land I also produced uh, a very nice proposal called Hill Four Orchards which is based around the concept of creating orchard planting schemes in the shapes of some of the hill forts in the area. So they looked initially at Dunn's Law and at Preston Cluch and created planting schemes for Dunn's Primary and Chernside Primary as well to have um, orchards planted interspersed with bulbs as well so that the colour comes through in the early spring. The Orchards project could support the curriculum in the schools as well as the benefits from the produce from the trees. Um, if the trees are planted far enough apart um, they decided that the council maintenance crews could drive the mowers around easily to cut the grass and then the spring bulbs could be planted in the centre um, and that's good to have because it's an early source of nectar for pollinators. The this was just a proposal so it was never realised but again the council have expressed an interest in this project and it hopefully will be something that will be developed in the future. Um, it could be a community planting event um, which would be ideal to have happen in around about November, December at the end of the year. This ties nicely back with the with their project origins and um, the children could be asked to or something under each tree like a talisman or a good luck or a memory um, and create some new archaeology in the area. Kate Campbell who is an established poet in the area submitted um, a set of really nice poems that tied in very closely with the landscape. She also wrote two new poems specifically for the project which are The Rig Weeps and also Whittader which can be found on the project website. For the online festival we had in May in 2020, we organised um, some of the members of the Duns players to read the poems and these were recorded and you can also listen to the recordings on the website. And um, the last project I'm going to talk about today is um, The Whitters Are Tapes by Ursentilla. Ursentilla are a sound art duo based in Edinburgh. Um, they were invited onto the project to get involved and come and record sounds in the natural environment. So they spent a number of days um, visiting different parts of the project area and recording sounds actually even in the river and in woodland and on top of hills. So they recorded natural environment sounds and they also played musical instruments in the environment and recorded those sounds. Then what they do is they take these sounds back to their studio and they um, start to edit them and build up layers of more musical instruments and electronic sounds on top of that along with spoken word and sometimes song and ballads as well. So they looked very carefully and researched a lot of the project and saw a lot of existing ballads of the area and 
looked at the archaeology, they were really interested in the LIDAR landscape that was produced and this is all incorporated into the pieces that they developed for the Whittender Tapes EP. Um, so we helped them produce this into a, a final CD and it comes in a really nice package and there's a booklet along with that that tells you about the tracks. Um, you can listen to some of the tracks and links from the Whittender website or you can find out more about your scintilla, they have a their own SoundCloud site as well. Um, so it was a really nice project. Um, and I'm going to leave you now with a couple of minutes of one of the track tracks from their EP. Thank you very much. <laughs>